A 15-year-old boy has died after being stabbed to death. And we're now getting reports of two people having been rushed to hospital this evening after yet another stabbing. Two uh, teenagers were stabbed. In we're the now getting reports of two people having been rushed to hospital this evening after yet another stabbing less than a Britain has seen a sharp rise in stabbings. In England and Wales, there have been over 44,000 offences involving a knife or a sharp instrument in the last 12 months. This is a 7% rise, and the highest it's been in eight years. It seems like every week we're seeing another young life lost to knife crime in the UK. Gang violence, drug-related crime, and social media wars have often been blamed, or the ease with which knives can be bought. And with every knife crime incident that takes place, cuts to policing are often blamed for the latest stabbing. If you look at the figures, what you see is that there's no direct correlation between certain crimes and police numbers. But I would be naive uh, to suggest that the reduced numbers of officers on the street for a whole variety of reasons, including, and I'm talking across the country here, including reduced officer numbers overall, has had no impact. I'm sure it's had an impact. Most victims are mainly young and male, with homicides by a knife or a sharp instrument rising more than 59%. Overproportionately, these victims are young black men. We held a thinking in a London college where we spoke to young people about the problem. We heard stories of several stabbings from people who knew and loved the victims. Paul Barnes lost his son, Kwamari, in 2017. One of my fondest memories of Kamari, I started playing music on my phone, yeah, and one of my friends was playing music on their phone as well. So we started to have a battle. They had better music for me on the phone. So he jumped up like, no, you're not, you're not going to bury my dad like that. No, you're not, you're not going to kill my dad like that. So he started to play his music on, the, on his phone and he won the competition. They were shocked to see, what, this 15 year old got music like that. He had all of the tunes on the phone, so he gave them a good hiding. And I think it, was, it went out with a bang. It went out with a bang. I, 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 I will never, ever, 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 ever forget that. On the 23rd of January 2017, it was about 3.20, walking out of school, a young lad jumped out on him with a knife. He was running saying, oh, help, 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 help. Somebody, he's going to stab me, he's going to stab me. This young lad still managed to stab him. He stabbed him three times. And with one of the stabs, he even managed to break his rib. That's how ferocious he went in with one of the stabs. No one came to his aid. They watched this young boy stab him three times. There was adults there. But unfortunately, by the time I got to hospital, I didn't get to see Kamari. But the best thing is his mum got to see him before he passed away. You know, and in, in my, in, to myself, yeah, I am so glad he didn't die on the spot. At least his mum got to spend a little, even if it was, a, even if it was five minutes the journey from here to there, you know, she, a comfort to me is but he got to see his mum before he passed and she got to see him. I wouldn't say I've got justice, I've got some form of justice. You know, him getting 14 years, you know, he can come out and have a life. I'm still, I was still living my life sentence. But, you know, that's, that's my life now. I go to the cemetery on a regular basis. You know, and um, it's been, that's been my life for the past two years. You know, it's not nice. A 15-year-old was found guilty for murdering him in September 2017. When sentenced, the defendant said, I don't know why I did it. I was scared and confused. Bryce is one of Kumari's best friends. He often spent time with him after school. By the time I got to Wembley, I had heard that he had been stabbed. But I didn't know he was dead until I got home. Mm -hmm. I had no words. And then I knew that that was, that was it. But it really saddened me because I know 
that had I went to see him now, probably could have still been alive today, but at the same token, had I gone, I could have been dead with him. So the two of us would have been lying next to each other there. Obviously, we live in a very dangerous generation, but especially being a young black male, it's very hard for us all over the place. But all the stuff that young black men in my generation and generations below me seem to get tied up in, that sort of stuff does not fear me. I've got sense to not go down the wrong path. But even sometimes, it's not even about going down the wrong path because Kamari didn't go down the wrong path. Yes, Kamari had certain friends who, you know, but he wasn't on the wrong path. He wasn't someone causing trouble after school or getting himself in mix up, as we know. And that just goes to show you that sometimes it doesn't matter what, like, way you go down, trouble can catch you at any time. Craig Pinkney is an urban youth specialist and a lecturer at University College Birmingham. He is one of the UK's leading experts on okay, gangs yeah, is, and serious this is probably youth the most, violence. This is probably more relaxed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think before we talk about the concept gang, we can just talk about groups. And the common thing is generally that these groups of individuals, whether male or female, had something that they wanted or had something that they wanted to keep, whether that was to do with power, whether that was to do with resources. And there was always an opposing group that either wanted or didn't like the fact that they had this something that they all wanted and you would see conflict. We're talking about young people that live in environments where they perceive there to be constant danger. They perceive there to be a threat. They think about other young people that they may have heard about. They may have seen young people being involved in aspects of violence. So they leave their household scared in most cases. We're also talking about young people that live in environments where there's high um, issues of mental health. You know, we're talking about young people that are anxious, depressed, um, they're, they're paranoid because of the things that are taking place within their particular environments. And then we expect young people to kind of navigate their way through life, knowing that these issues exist within their environment. Because when you look at kind of, again, the, the, the breakup or the makeup of what gangs are, they represent what I call in my research surrogate families and gangs operate as such. And when you think about what families have in terms of the safety element, they talk about that belonging element, that, that idea that you can be part of a group and people make you feel that you, you're a part of something that enables you to be safe. I think it's also about economics. I don't think we can never have this conversation about gangs and violence without understanding economics. We live in a capitalized society where young people that live within communities where there's issues around high unemployment and lack of resources and lack of opportunity to find work, those young people need to find ways of making money. And young people are desperate. But at the same time, these young people have been marketed. They're still marketing by the latest pair of trainers, still buy the latest iPhones and Samsungs and so on and so forth. So I think sometimes I think we're too hard on young people. We kind of act like young people are like aliens that have come from a planet and we as adults do not put them in environments where we're forcing these things on them. You know, young people don't own Nike. Young people don't own Adidas, they don't own Puma, they don't own any of these big music labels that want them to make music. They don't own any of these electronic companies that want them to buy their gadgets. But for some reason we say that these young people are not supposed to have these things. I mean, they're supposed to have ways that they're supposed to get it, but then there's no options for them to, to get an opportunity to get those things in the first place. You can have a young person that lives on an estate, a young person that lives on the street, and their next door neighbor may be a family friend and may decide that they take a liking to this particular young person and say, come on, hang out with me for the day. There's no issues, there's no problems, there's no violence. That young person that comes out of the household and starts hanging around with their neighbor may at some particular point in time may decide that they want to engage in other forms of criminality if that individual is. So that individual may be involved in selling drugs. And that young person may feel that, you know what, I want to get on, I want to get an opportunity. 
So I wouldn't use the word grooming, I would use the word exploitation. Because I think our young people are being exploited. So when we're talking about, well, how did you join the group? I couldn't tell you a point of when I joined the group because there was already a part of the family anyway. The all-party parliamentary group on knife crime found that councils with large cuts to youth services were more likely to have also seen an increase in knife crime. The average council spending on these services has reduced by 28%. And some argue that they are the best early intervention tools for young vulnerable people. Corey Johnson is a music producer. To keep away from disruptive influences like gangs and violence, Corey's youth charity is trying to create opportunities for young people in business and the arts. So this is the same process when it was like Quadrophena and you had the mods and like the craze and so it's not nothing new except for that these kids aren't making any money. So there's no money in it, there's no, they're not making thousands and thousands of pounds, they're not living a lavish lifestyle. Like this is really just frustrated young people with a lack of something to do. Literally it's not in their DNA to even be like this. It's not generally, they're not that generation. This is a gap between the generations and a lack of support and services. That's what the main thing is. A lot of these young people are just scared. So they're accessing the knives in the home because it's a lot easier to get. Um, and a lot of them that are carrying knives, they're only carrying it because they don't want to be the victim. So they're thinking, well, I don't want it to happen to me. Or at least there's a bravado that goes along with it. So we highlight so much of the negative in the media. We don't actually show them any of the positive that's happening. There isn't that belief that that could be them. So what they're seeing every day um, is literally only scaring them when they need to see more inspirational figures and not just in music and entertainment, but in different industries, like people that have come from the same areas, same background as them, same culture as them, and aspire to do some really great things. This reinforces this conversation about the racialized social structures that we live in, which is a racist and hostile socialized structure where we look at um, particular crimes and then we put them towards specific types of groups. You know, we look at issues of terrorism, but when you hear terrorism, it's synonymous with Muslim. And then we get that narrative in the media over and over and over and over again. So then when something happens, like quite recently um, in New Zealand, where this individual that is a terrorist that committed those particular acts, we, it's like we're struggling to use the word terrorist, but the action is exactly the same. And I can guarantee if that was a young man that was a Muslim that committed those particular acts, the word ISIS inspired, Al Qaeda inspires, terrorist, jihadist, and all of those words would have been thrown in the front line and the headline um, of our um, papers every single day. So when we're talking about gangs specifically, young people are also aware that when it relates to violence within their communities, they also now believe and perceive violence to come from their own communities and only their own communities because the media also help shape thoughts and perception about each other. So if I have a fear in my community, guess who my fear is going to be mostly targeted towards? The people that look like me. With every stabbing that takes place, it's clear we're not learning quickly enough about what could have been done to save a young life. Those that are drawn into the cycle of violence, exploited by the lack of opportunities around them, are the ones that need the help the most. They do not feel protected. They don't think we can protect them enough. So this is what we need to show them. We need to show these young kids, but we could, you're safe. You know, you don't need to carry enough to be safe. So unless the government does something about that to show that these kids are safe out there, they're not going to carry, they're not going to stop carrying knives because it's only, they feel protected. <laughs> it breaks my heart, man. It breaks my heart. It does. It breaks my heart to know, but there are babies, man. There are babies. I've had enough because nothing's changed. The government are not doing anything about it. They claim they are, they're not. I'm out here trying to rebuild my life. I won't get, ever get to see my son get married. And I need the government to acknowledge me, not only me, but my children and all of us victims of knife crime. When I wake up and I see the tears in my son and my daughter's eyes, and knowing as a mother I cannot do anything about that, it breaks my heart, OK? And then you're told he's dead. What do you mean, my son is dead?
But yeah, I guess those that like token appreciation for Kamari. Kamari, we, sometimes when we're on the road, Kamari always got a Lucas aid. Work, work from Harlesden, Willesden all the way to Harlesden. Kamari drink about four Lucas aid. He did love a Lucas aid though, yeah. Good luck. 